Editing is one of the most important points of production on any project, whether it's a film, a music video, a commercial, or a web series like ours. And there's plenty of important concepts that will help you in shaping your edit, which we got into a few weeks ago with our Theory of Editing episode. Link to that in the notes. But that is not what we're talking about today. Instead of the creative, we're talking about the technical, things that will allow you to move faster and more fluidly so that you can hone in on the creative that much more. And these are very much coming from an us thing. Everyone is different. Everyone has their different needs and process, but these are 10 things that we turn to the most to move quickly with our edits. <laughs> And for number one, let's start with the most obvious, which is watching and organizing your footage. When you are in the thick of it, you don't want to have to go hunting down for that thing that you think that you got on the day, but you aren't entirely sure. By watching the footage or re-watching if you were there when the shooting happened, you're creating a fresh log in your mind of what you have and reshaping the way that you're thinking about the project based on what you actually have. And for organizing, to be honest, I used to be really terrible with this until Lucas Harger chastised me. Okay, are you shitting me? <laughs> but for me, this has become a make it or break it thing, organizing into bins with scenes, shots, and even characters, depending on what it is. With Film Riot specifically, what we've landed on that works really well with us is a bin for sequences, assets, which inside here will have our graphics and things like overlays, solids, aspect ratio bars, then footage, and inside here having our stand-ups, which is the talking head bits or the hosting bits like this right here. Then if there's a sketch, we will have a folder for that. That. Then for any clips being used like B-roll or anything pulled from offline, screen caps and anything else specific. Next would be an audio folder and inside here we'll have music, sound effects and any VO or production audio. And depending on the project, this can go deeper, but for a general Film Riot episode, this tends to be our bin structure that lets us find what we need quickly. Number two is to use thumbnails. More often than not, once I have my footage built out into these bins, I'll open the bins that I'm working with in their own tabs and set those to thumbnails so I can click through very quickly to see all the things that I have. And I can, of course, set in and out points right on my thumbnails and pull them right down into the timeline. It's just a very fast way to work through your clips. Number three is hotkeys. Hotkeys, as we all know, are magical. It takes a bit of getting used to once you set them up, but when you get that muscle memory locked in, you can really move incredibly fast. Of course, in Premiere or any other software, you can go into your hotkey editor and customize things to work work best for you. For me, when working specifically with a Film Riot episode, I've set up my one, two, and three keys to act like my JKL. So one plays backward, two stops, and three plays forward. Then I have E as my split. So with the playhead over a clip, I hit E and it splits that clip. Then Q and W will move backward and forward one frame. And then I can set an in point with this key here and an out point with number four. So with this setup, I can edit without having to move my hand from the key keyboard 90% of the time, which makes me much faster, especially when cutting something like stand-ups or a podcast. And when it comes to hotkeys, something we use often is a deck, specifically the Loop Deck CT. And Loop Deck is a partner on this episode, but we've been using their decks for years, including the CT here. This is a control surface that allows you to create custom shortcuts and macros for your applications. And it also comes with pre-made profiles for tons of apps, but we're focusing in on Premiere here, of course. The deck automatically recognizes the app that you're in and adjusts itself to work with, as you can see here. But you can also open the app that comes with the deck to fully customize this thing however you like. You can really dig in and make it uniquely yours. And in each workspace, you can create several pages, which you can switch between all of those just by swiping. You can scrub your timeline with the big scroll wheel moving quickly through or hold function and scroll frame by frame. You also have an undo and save and a much simpler way to zoom in and out of your timeline and just about any other function you need. And what I really love about this one is its size. We place it right next to our keyboard to act as an extension of the keyboard and use it for specific hotkeys and to use it to scroll wheel, shuttle through clips, trim clips, and so on. It's also just sexy looking, which is a nice plus, but mainly what this is great for is speeding up your process and giving you finer details over things like color grading and trimming. But we'll look into more of that later. Number four is nesting and this is sticking with something we 
do when editing things like podcasts or stand-ups. Anything where there is a long clip that you are editing down. For us, once we have the standard pass of the stand-ups cut, we will nest that into its own sequence, then run edit detection to get all of our cuts back. Now we can continue our work on refining the episode. And the reason that we do it like this is because now we can jump into the nested sequence and grade the stand-ups here in the end very simply or replace the audio or video if needed without having to do extra work. So it's basically a non-destructive way to work. And given how fast we move, this has been a lifesaver several times over. Number five is pancake timeline editing, which is an idea that came from Bashi Nenemansky. This idea is that you stack the timeline so that you have your main and above that some B-roll or selects to easily bring between the two. There's a specific way to set this up to really make it work well. So check out a link in the notes below for Vashi's Adobe Max presentation for that. But this is something I use on every single project. Number six is proxies. Not gonna lie, in the past, there were so many times that I just suffered through a horribly slow playback instead of doing this. No idea why. The idea is that if you are working with files that are slowing down your system, like 4K or 8K, whatever it is, you create smaller, more manageable video files to work with, then switch back to the original for the export. Doing this in Premiere is incredibly simple. You just right click and select create proxies. Then you get this box here, select your format and where you want these files to be saved and Premiere does the rest. If you have a lot of files, you can just leave this going overnight. Then we can add our toggle proxies button, flip between proxies and full just with the click here. When it's blue, it's proxies, white, it's the original. As a bonus tip, if you are ever working with MP4s, which aren't the best, you can often get these glitches in the image that don't exist in the actual file, but will exist when you export it out as well. If you just right click and render replace, you'll be good to go. Or of course, convert before you ever bring it in. Number seven is one that I use constantly, and that is adding your audio effects to your audio tracks instead of individual clips. This is a bit of a 101 tip, but it's one that can solve a lot of problems. To set up for this, I keep my audio tracks very organized. Only dialogue on these tracks, fully type effects on these, sound design on these tracks, music on these tracks, and so on. By keeping them organized, you can adjust all the clips needing adjustment on that individual track. It's like using an adjustment layer for color grading, an overall correction, then individual tweaks where needed. And speaking of color grading, number eight is using adjustment layers and the color workspace for your final grade and corrections. For me, I always throw on an overall grade using an adjustment layer, then you move to the color workspace and as you move through the timeline, Lumetri will automatically select the clip on the selected track that your playhead is over. So you can set your overall style, then move quickly through adjusting individual clips where needed. And going back to Loop Deck, color is where I love this thing the absolute most and what I use it the most for. Similar to other control decks, having these controls to precisely dial the different parameters is massive. Here you have your selection for your highs, mids, and lows you select with the touch screen here and then make your adjustments. Then with the knobs up here, you can shift your color temp, your whites, your saturation, tint, blacks, or jump to the vignette, curves, or even switch between basic and creative corrections. And another thing that I love is hitting this full screen button here, then doing these adjustments inside of that full screen with more detail and less distractions. Again, you can accomplish the same stuff without a deck like this, but this does give you finer controls and less clicks, which is is what I'm always working toward with everything we do. Number nine is stock assets. We've talked about using several for years with our main go-tos being Artlist, Artgrid, Musicbed, Film Supply, and Envato. But there are a lot of others that you can use as well, including some free options like Unsplash, Pexels, and MixKit. But stock footage, music, and sound effects are key when doing quick turnaround work or pitch work. Basically, every episode that we put out has some kind of stock in there, whether it's footage, image, graphics or music, often you either don't have the budget or the time to get the assets you need. So these resources are instrumental in moving quickly and accomplishing the goals that you set out for. This one is maybe a bit obvious for a lot of you, but I think there are a lot of people who aren't aware of how affordable and sometimes free a lot of these assets have become. So we'll put a bunch of links in the notes below for you. And our last tip is another one that is one of the biggest for me, and that is Soundly. And like the stock sites that we just mentioned, Soundly has has nothing to do with this episode. And it's another one that I learned of thanks to Lucas Harger. 
my lady. This is an app that will organize your sound effects all in one place, making them searchable and easy to add to your project. Sound effects were always the most time consuming, frustrating point for me for a while. And having massive folders that I would have to bring into the project and then audition them there, it's a very clumsy way to work that way. But Soundly lets you search and audition sounds quickly. Then when you find the ones that you want, you can either bring in the full clip or select just a small section that you plan to use. You can also do some effects, normalize, adjust volume, speed, or reverse, all before bringing into your software as well. And it's just drag and drop between the two pieces of software, which is incredibly cool. And the other major factor is their massive library of sounds. And more often than not, we're able to find what we need for the project we're working on here. And now to get the full library, it is $15 a month, but you can also start with a free version that lets you organize 2,500 local files and has a bunch of free sounds in the library as well. So either way, this one is a must have. But that's it for for today, links to everything we talked about in the notes below, including links to where you can find more about the Loop Deck. It really is a massively helpful device. Even being able to open my apps with just one button or control Spotify is really great. It has so many uses and is massively customizable across a ton of different apps. So definitely give that a look. And until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat.